I'm going to talk about skin manifestations of systemic disease. Um, I, I'd like to start with this first comment that the skin is both the mirror and a window of the human body. The skin commonly tells the story and unleashes findings representing underlying internal or systemic ramifications of overall health and disease. So my simple point, if you get nothing else out of this talk, is any dermatologic condition that we said it's inflammatory, especially, or cutaneous lesions that we can't explain, certainly consider that there may be go something going on on the inside. And we look at this from the perspective of cutaneous manifestations of endocrinologic disease, rheumatologic disease, perineoplastic syndromes, cardiovascular conditions, and those affecting other organ systems. And there's a variety of texts, including the landmark uh, publication and text uh, by Erwin, Erwin Braverman from Yale, and then here's Callan's book on systemic disease, and, and there's several others. Um, Let's start with endocrinologic uh, manifestations or dermatologic manifestations of, of endocrine disorders like in diabetes. Approximately 30% of individuals with diabetes will develop skin lesions at, at one point or another uh, during their duration of having diabetes. And the prevalence of these cutaneous findings really don't differ between type 1 and type 2 diabetics. However, type 1 diabetics tend to have more autoimmune phenomenon and uh, type 2 diabetics tend to have more uh, cutaneous infectious manifestations of diabetes. So you all know what this is. This is Necrobiosis Lipoetica Diabeticorum, and it may be a cutaneous manifestation of diabetes or uh, that systemic disease, and oftentimes it will ulcerate. Uh, here's other clinical pictures. It takes on this kind of typical yellowish, yellowish orange, sometimes with a centrally clear and a peripherally red border. Uh, infiltrative at the beginning and eventually it may ulcerate and you can see here some of the histopathologic manifestations where we see these interstitial and palisaded granulomas and if you look to the left in the lower power view it almost looks like a layer cake and that's one of the hallmarks of NLD histopathologically. Um, three times more common in women. Uh, we discussed the overall appearance. You see here just another very nice clinical picture of NLD. And, and, and subtle, about 13% of the time without treatment, and you can really treat this somewhat adequately with uh, topical and intralesional corticosteroids. There are some new studies looking at the use of some uh, other agents like topical Janus kinase inhibitors, systemic Janus kinase inhibitors, and even in the past topical calcium urine inhibitors. Um, classically occurs bilaterally, usually on the anterior tibular regions, and spontaneous resolution occurs just about under 20% of the time. Uh, Bullis diabeticorum uh, occurs uncommonly in about 0.5% of diabetics, but it is pretty distinct. You'll recognize it does sometimes uh, look a little bit like bullous pemphigoid, particularly since this tends to occur as well in, in older diabetics, uh, but nevertheless, um, it is common on the dorsal aspects of the feet, anterior tibial regions, the lateral aspects of the feet. Um, it will less commonly uh, present as a tense boy that is also a hemorrhagic. Here's just a couple of other pictures. Again, typically on the dorsal side of the foot. And when we look at this histopathologically, it's cell poor, almost like uh, porphyria cutanea tarda. And here's just some really nice histopathology of bullous diabeticorum. Uh, you see this uh, intraepithelial split right here. And it almost takes on like a pseudo tombstoning phenomenon like we see in Pemphigus vulgaris. Acanthosis nigricans. We'll see this across a, a number of potential, uh, uh, one of the manifestations of a skin sign of systemic disease. It's a velvety hyperpigmentation. We'll usually see it in the folds, commonly in the axillary folds. But when we start to see it in certain locations like the dorsal hands, or if we see it widespread, emanating from the axillary regions but becoming more diffuse, uh, be thinking of uh, internal malignancy or certainly someone who has diabetes. And this is what this is saying here. We'll also see it as part of other endocrinopa endocrinopathies um, uh, like acromegaly and Cushing's disease, uh, also sometimes in hypothyroidism. And that's just an example on the superimposed animated picture where we really see uh, an individual with acanthosis nigricans that has really become uh, more widespread and you must have an index of suspicion for underlying uh, malignancy. Continuous uh, infections in diabetes occur in about 20 to 50 percent of individuals with poorly controlled diabetes. It is a common presenting sign of diabetes, as we all know, uh, balanitis, uh, uh, intertrigo by candidiasis. Um, why has that happened? Well, some discussed really throughout this uh, 
meetings so far, diabetics suffer from abnormal microcirculation matters, uh, neuropathy, decreased phagocytosis and killing activity, and also uh, impaired leukocyte uh, adherence. And it may be actually one of their challenges sometimes when we're treating them with some biologic therapies, including drugs like uh, interleukin-17 blockers, and they suffer from per per peripheral vascular disease. And here's just ni nice examples of candidiasis uh, in individuals with di uh, diabetes. And so this could be the presenting sign uh, of diabetes. And it kind of it, it compels us, if you will, to make sure that these individuals are being followed by a general physician and that they get a hemoglobin A1C and get some fasting lab work. There are other infections associated with diabetes, like malignant otitis externa, ex externa it's called by caused by pseudomonas. Um, can be really severe. We can see the chondritis uh, up here on the caption on the right in the photograph. Um, these patients can get underlying osteomyelitis. Erythrasma, which is caused by Carinobacterium minotissimum, can also be a presenting sign of diabetes. And you know that that's an intertrigal, most commonly in the intertriginous region in the groin area. And you can see that this is the positive woods lamp for a coral red fluorescence. Uh, eruptive diabetic xanthomas are not uncommon in diabetics. These diabetics typically have uncontrolled hypertriglyceridemia, firm, non-tender, yellowish to yellowish-orange uh, papules and nodules, and you can see the areas where these tend to occur, usually on the extensive, sur extensive surfaces and sometimes uh, on the buttocks. And this is most certainly in individuals who are poorly controlled diabetics. And again, uh, once again, uh, they usually have background uh, hyperlipidemia, specifically hypertriglyceridemia. We'll see these shin spots or diabetic dermopathy in about 30%, uh, up to 30% of diabetics. Typically, again, this is when they have poorly controlled diabetics. We tend to see it more commonly in individuals uh, with diabetic neuropathy and those that have more peripheral vascular disease associated with di diabetes. And there's one picture of this. It almost looks like a old burnt out stasis change with hemosiderin deposition, but you see the picture on the left. Uh, there are these small uh, macules and patches. Some of them become a little coalescent, and they do have some atrophic centers. Thyroid disease is another place where we'll see some uh, dermatologic manifestations of systemic disease, both uh, hyper and hyper hypothyroidism. Um, we know that thyroid hormone does play a pivotal role in growth, uh, uh, formation of hair, uh, sebum production. Um, it does play an important role in protein synthesis and the cell cycle, mitoses, responsible for epithelial changes, um, and it is responsible as well to some degree for peripheral blood flow and peripheral, peripheral vasodilatation. Uh, in hyperthyroidism in general, the skin is often um, warm, moist. Uh, there may be facial, uh, facial flushing. Uh, these individuals can present also with palmar erythema. The hair is often fine and friable, and they may present with some hyperhidrosis. And of course, from a systemic perspective, these patients may have, ha have high pulse rates uh, and uh, underlying tachycardia, and so sometimes we have to send them out to the cardiologist. Scleral mixed edema is an important dermatologic manifestation of cutaneous disease and also seen in hyperthyroidism, numerous firm white to whitish yellow or pink papules, often on the face trunk, uh, can be on the extremities as well, and they occur because of an accumulation of hyaluronic acid. And, and accumulation of hyaluronic acid is not uncommon in patients with thyroid disease, as we will see in a couple of minutes, uh, in individuals with pretibial myxedema. And this is just another presentation of scleral myxedema in hyperthyroidism. So Graves' dermopathy or pretibial myxedema, which occurs somewhere between about half and 4% of individuals with um, Graves disease or hyperthyroidism. It's often a late manifestation. We'll see it associated with uh, ophthalmopathy associated with thyroid disease almost 100% of the time. Uh, the skin will take on this peau d'orange kind of appearance. It looks very edematous. It looks like edema, but it really is not typical uh, pitting edema. And you see that there's an accumulation of hyaluronic acid, as we see here. So this is pretibial mix edema. It's typically bilateral. We'll see it associated with Graves disease. And again, the clinical findings are due to an abundance of hyaluronic acid depositing in the dermis. So this is a, a nice publication uh, that is going to be coming out. This is uh, just uh, preprint, if you will, June 6, 2022. Tepertumumab, um, a novel therapy for pretibial myxedema. 
And you know, you'll wonder why I'm putting up a teprotumumab for thyroid eye disease. Well, Josh Mervis, who's a resident, a third year resident at the University of Miami, kind of thought it would be interesting that a, a drug like this, which is an insulin growth factor receptor inhibitor, that it works in ocular manifestations of thyroid disease, that it might work well in pretibial myxedema, so, so stay tuned. We also see a variety of immune bullous disorders presenting in the setting of thyroid disease, so be thinking of thyroid disease in the background of individuals with immune bullous disorders like pemphigus foliaceus and pemphigus vulgaris in preg pregnant women, um, herpes gestationis or pemphigoid gestationis if you prefer to call it that, and bullous pemphigoid as well as dermatitis or pediformis. Uh, we certainly know that there are an abundance of uh, malignancy and perineoplastic syndromes where there are cutaneous manifestations of those conditions. We have alluded to some of this already in talking about acanthosis nigricans, but acne in general that is quite resistant to therapy may raise your antennas for certain adrenal tumors, flushing with carcinoid syndrome, jaundice with bile duct carcinoma. And of course, there is the infamous uh, clinical presentation, albeit rare, of the grain of wood appearance of the skin, these kind of whirly, round uh, grain of wood type appearances that we see as cutaneous manifestations of malignancies in erythema gyrotum repens. Uh, acquired ichthyosis can be a cutaneous manifestation of malignancy. And certainly, if we see it suddenly in adulthood, it may raise a sus suspicion from the most common presentation, and that is Hodgkin's disease. But we can see it in individuals who have essential fatty acid deficiencies, and as well, it can be drug-induced from HMG Cauray reductase inhibitors. So this is a middle-aged gentleman who presents what looks like really severe, I don't know, seborrheic dermatitis. It could be a patient with psoriasis. Um, he has symmetrical erythematous to violaceous psoriasiform plaques in his nasal bridge along his helices. He also has some lesions on his distal extremities. He has a xanthonychia, subungual hyperkeratosis. He has some horizontal and longitudinal grooves uh, ridging in his nails. These are mostly the appearance of like Bose lines about 75% of the time. And this patient has an upper aero digestive tract carcinoma, and he has, uh, as you know, uh, Bezex. Um, perineoplastic syndrome. More common in men and skin findings uh, precede the diagnosis by about two to six months. And these are just some other unique findings that you will see in Bezek syndrome. We see this xanthonychia here, this kind of yellowing in the nails, really not like in yellow nail syndrome where the entire nail is involved. And we see this almost mechanic-like nails that we see uh, in uh, dermatomyositis. Uh, hard to see in the picture here, but I can tell you that there are some horizontal, you see these kind of uh, vertical ridges, almost like uh, onychorexis, and these are Bose lines here, so there's these horizontal grooves that we'll see in individuals with uh, basex perineoplastic syndrome. Any subcutaneous nodule, erosive subcutaneous nodule that you see in the scalp that you cannot explain is a, a potential metastatic malignancy uh, until proven otherwise. So this is alopecia neoplastica. Uh, scalp metastases may take the form of a solitary or multiple nodules, typically in their scalp. They do spread he hematogenously from a primary source like breast, lung, or genital urinary carcinoma. Not uncommon in, in, in men that we will see metastatic prostate cancer present as a solitary nodule in the scalp. Um, there may be um, scarring from breast cancer, metastasis, and it would be very difficult to diagnose these, so really have an index of suspicion. And it may just be one out, uh, round area of alopecia with just a little bit of infiltration. It doesn't really feel like a subcutaneous nodule, so have an index of su suspicion and definitely do uh, a biopsy. And we do see this in individuals with uh, extramarinary Paget disease, and this is an example of an individual with alopecia neoplastica who has underlying um, extramarinary Paget's disease of the breast. That's just another example of a cutaneous lesion in the scalp, and you can really see in that last picture how it can look very much like alopecia areata, and you see these uh, changes on the nipple that uh, occurred in this individual with extramarinary Paget's disease over time, and this ind individual has underlying ductal breast carcinoma. Uh, you see these cutaneous manifestations here. This is a patient with dermatomyositis. Remember, this is a cutaneous manifestation of systemic disease, which is dermatomyositis. But I presented here in this setting uh, of uh, systemic signs of malignancy and perineoplastic syndromes, because as you know, 
uh, individuals with Gotrin's plaques who have dermatomyositis, they really have to be worked up uh, for underlying malignancy like thyroid carcinoma and of course most commonly ovarian carcinoma. This is the classical holster sign. You see this uh, infiltrate in the indurated plaques that look like they actually follow the pattern uh, of a holster. Uh, dermatomyositis is a, a rare uh, cutaneous and muscular disease, uh, often characterized uh, by the presence of a shawl sign. The patients will have Gotrin's plaques that we saw in the clinical photos I provided, and it is most commonly associated with ovarian cancer. And there are a whole host of other malignancies that have been found commonly uh, with uh, dermatomyositis. And so this is a very nice article that I read looking at anti-TAF1 uh, gamma antibody positive dermatomyositis. Um, so this transcription intermediator factor, gamma, uh, is found positive. It's very high, very common. It's an important serology that we measure uh, in individuals who may have underlying malignancy. And moreover, in this very nice study, they were able to correlate uh, these three uh, serologies here, including TIF1 uh, gamma, with certain uh, presentations of dermatomyositis, including the Shawl sign, um, also the uh, mechanics hand, um, the heliotrope graph, as well, and also high ferritin levels, which I also found uh, very interesting. And we just see here uh, the correlation between the TIF1 uh, gamma positive serology and a variety of uh, underlying malignancies, including uterine cancer. Uh, there were a couple of ovarian cancers and, and a, whole, a whole host of other malignancies. And really, just it was just published a, a number of months ago. Um, when you see individuals who have underlying breast carcinoma or they're not known to have underlying breast carcinoma and you see this type of you know, mastitis type presentation, the so-called carcinoma oncoras or uh, carcinoma er erysipeloides, uh, uh, be concerned for underlying uh, breast carcinoma or even um, locally metastatic breast carcinoma. Also notice sclerodermoid carcinoma or carcinoma er erysipeloides. There's usually an indurated, infiltrated erythematous uh, plaque that infiltrates almost the entire breast region. Uh, and um, this is the result of metastatic breast cancer, locally metastatic breast cancer, typically with infiltration uh, from the lymphatic vessels. These are tripalms uh, tri um, uh, right here, as you see to the right, a couple of examples of tripalms. They look like tripe. Um, they're characterized by velvety palms. We'll actually see this uh, sometimes in combination uh, with acanthosis nig nigricans. About 90% of the time, it is associated with an underlying uh, internal malignancy. So be on the lookout for uh, tripe palms. And we see it in commonly with gastrointestinal carcinomas very commonly and uh, pulmonary carcinoma. And, and, and in cases where you see tripe palms, and you don't have underlying acanthosis nigricans, by far and away, those individuals, when you're looking for malignancy, if you find one, it's very likely to be lung uh, cancer. Uh, a sudden onset of uh, seborrheic keratosis should uh, make us concerned about the sign of lesser Trelot or Trelot syndrome. Uh, we'll see this with underlying gastrointestinal carcinomas, and it may be associated with both acanthosis nigricans and tripalms. Um, we can also see uh, the Trelot syndrome in the setting of certain medications. There have actually been published reports uh, with the onset of multiple seborrheic keratosis with use of agents like uh, adalidumab, uh, venurafenib, um, dibrafenib, uh, fifluorouracil. And so, you know, be on the lookout. Look uh, at medications when you think that someone may have the rare presentation of the Trelot syndrome. Again, we talked a lot about acanthosis nigricans. Once again, just be concerned that you see this intertriginous velvety presentation, and it is more than what you are seeing in just a diabetic or just someone who seems to have pseudo-acanthosis nigricans because perhaps they are morbidly obese. And when we see them in association with tripalms, uh, be on the lookout uh, for an underlying malignancy. Uh, this is an individual with necrolytic migratory erythema. These are individuals who have, sometimes it's a little bit more subtle than this. It's not always so erosive as in that dramatic picture. Uh, we see these erosive erythematous patches, uh, plaques, vesicles, bullae. They tend to form, as I said, in intradigenous regions, sometimes uh, in the gluteal region uh, emanating from the intergluteal cleft, and these are associated with an underlying uh, glucocono glucoconoma. Uh, these are classical periocular infiltrated waxy yellow plaques, deep-seated plaques uh, that we see coalescent and also extend into the zygomatic region, a very classical presentation of necrobiotic xanthogranuloma. 
and you have to be concerned in these patients. These patients do need to undergo a skin biopsy to confirm such, and as you all know, this is associated with an IgG kappa paraproteinemia. It's also associated with MUGUS and also other uh, monoclonal gammopathies. And this was just a really nice systemic review that was recently published, uh, mostly focusing on therapy, and I'll just summarize it for you, that uh, the most aggressive and appropriate and successful therapies for treating necrobiotic xanthogranuloma include a combination of high-dose intravenous corticosteroids in combination with intravenous immune globulin. This is a patient who's presenting with wheel-like, round wheel-like urticarial-type plaques with central clearing that are very typical of a neutrophilic urticaria that is known as Schnitzner syndrome. It is fairly uncommon. It's a chronic urticaria. It's usually associated uh, with uh, intermittent fevers. Sometimes there's osteosclerotic bone lesions. These patients will present to the clinic with their urticaria, but they will feel unwell. Not always. It can be subtle. I have had one case in my career, uh, and uh, anakinra is an agent that actually is quite helpful in managing this, in addition to other therapies like antihistamines, systemic corticosteroids. And because it is a neutrophilic urticaria, uh, anti-neutrophil uh, agents like colchicine uh, and dapsone may also be used. And again, there was a recent uh, publication in this last few years that highlighted uh, a number of cases uh, presenting with Citrus syndrome, which is uh, a pretty rare disorder. Uh, individuals that present with this almost Stevens-Johnson-like uh, lower and upper labial crusting, also, uh, often having oral lesions as well, uh, are individuals that may have paraneoplastic pemphigus. Uh, be on the lookout for this condition. It is quite uh, severe with a 90% mortality. Um, it does have a very interesting presentation. Uh, instead of it having uh, just um, these oral labial lesions and this typical crusting that almost looks like Stephen Johnson light, but also one of the tips off, tip offs is more of an upper labial involvement. Uh, but, but the lesions associated with this condition are really versatile. They're very heterogeneous. Well, we'll see features of erythema multiforme, a bolus pemphigoid, traditional uh, pemphigus vulgaris, and even some features of, of lichen planus. And so these patients may have underlying Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, CLL. In children, there's an entity known as Castleman's disease, which is the most common uh, association of paraneoplastic pemphigus uh, in children. And so these individuals have thymomas uh, or sarcomas. Very difficult to treat this. This is a very recent publication that actually looked at the, the, not only the severity of perineoplastic uh, pemphigus, but also in the setting of, of one of the more common presentations, which is uh, follicular lymphoma. This was actually a patient who was misdiagnosed as ha having chronic recurrent Stevens-Johnson syndrome. You see some of the clinical and histopathologic features here. And uh, when you do a biopsy in these individuals, you will see um, a vacuo vacuolar interface dermatitis. There'll be dyskeratotic cells. There will sometimes be necrotic keratinocytes, but we really don't see typically acantholysis. And this is just another clinical presentation uh, of a patient from the study who really is uh, almost uh, erythrodermic. Uh, challenging to diagnose this condition, but the point is that always have an index of suspicion, and these patients will end up with erosions in their esophagus, and they must be treated promptly. Here's a patient who has a keratoderma, a keratoderma that is occurring on pressure points, and this keratoderma takes on a very typical yellowish hue, as you see here on these pressure points, and this is pretty typical of Howell-Evans syndrome. Uh, these patients, by far and away, always have an underlying uh, gastrointestinal carcinoma, and it is uh, usually an esophageal uh, malignancy. Uh, autosomal dominant inheritance, it has a typical and classical symmetrical presentation, uh, as I just showed you, and these patients may also have leukokeratosis oris. Here's an individual with hypertrichosis uh, ligonosa acquisita. So basically, these patients have vellus hairs. They're mostly confined to the nose. They may present on the nose and the preauricular region. And these individuals will often have an underlying um, malignancy. Typically, it's uh, either lung cancer or colorectal carcinoma, less commonly breast cancer. And we can see these in individuals with anorexia nervosa, individuals who are experiencing cachexia as well, more common in females, and it tends to occur in middle age. Look, let's look in some 
uh, dermatologic manifestations of systemic rheumatic diseases. And so you know what this is. This is scleroderma. You see profound sclerodactyly. This, these are morphiform changes that we can see in individuals with systemic sclerosis. This beak-like nose, you notice that this is a middle-aged woman who has absolutely no wrinkles. No, she's not had a really good Botox session with, uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Munavali, but um, has unfortunately scleroderma. And uh, we see here, um, I'll show this on close-up in a couple moments, but, but be on the lookout for a lot of these rheumatologic disorders uh, for um, these kind of nail bed, um, uh, nail bed abnormalities. And also, uh, these patients will have proximal nail fold abnormalities, um, uh, calcium deposits, uh, sclerodactyly, Raynaud's phenomenon, digital ulcers. These should also be some hallmark manifestations of an individual's with underlying systemic sclerosis. And those are some of the other manifestations. Just, you know, we use our dermato dermatoscopes to look at cutaneous lesions, uh, both um, melanocytic and non-melanocytic, but take it out and utilize your dermatoscope to uh, find some of these unique features uh, like these uh, dilated cuticle or proximal nail fold dilated capillaries that we often see in these rheumatic disorders. So don't forget to use your dermatoscope. This is a malar rash of lupus erythematosus. It's a reminder for us of the diagnostic criteria for lupus, of which there are 11 specific diagnostic criteria from the Marin College of Rheumatology. Uh, this is subacute cutaneous lupus. It's not necessarily a cutaneous sign of systemic disease, but it is more important for you to have an underlying concern for uh, potential medications that may initiate subacute cutaneous lupus, and there are a whole host of them. Uh, features of uh, subcutaneous lupus uh, include um, these um, annular-like lesions with peripheral scaling. It often have a, a kind of a carpet tack-like scaling that we'll also see in, in, in discoid lupus erythematosus, but they'll have a profound central clearing, and there's also often a, a, a symmetrical distribution, and here's some really nice clinical photos. There are a whole host of therapies that may induce subacute cutaneous lupus, um, many of them here, uh, benzodiazepines, biologics, diuretic agents, vasodilators, antipsychotics. It's an enormous list of drugs, um, and I've had a number of patients over the years, including uh, a number of times, at least two times, uh, agents like uh, terbinafine uh, causing um, a uh, lupus-like appearance that is more like a subacute cutaneous lupus. Uh, cutaneous manifestations of cardiovascular disease. This is an individual with clubbing, so you know that this is an increase in the angle between the proximal nail fold and the nail plate. That angle is known as Lovibond's angle, and it's due to connected tissue proliferation between the nail matrix and the underlying distal matrix. Flushing can be a cutaneous manifestation of cardiovascular disease. Uh, these may be from tumors producing vasoaxic substances like carcinoid tumors, uh, also multiple endocrine neoplasias. There are some cutaneous manifestations of conditions like infectious uh, endocarditis, like oslinodes and Janeway lesions, so be on the lookout for that, and as well, splinter hemorrhages. Of course, when the splinter hemorrhages are distal, think of trauma. When they're more proximal, think of systemic disease, uh, like uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis. Here's some uh, cutaneous manifestations of rheumatic fever. Uh, including subcutaneous nodule. We'll tend to see these on the bony prominences and the hallmark manifestation of rheumatic fever, which is erythema marginatum. Pyoderma gangrenosum is quite a representative uh, skin sign of systemic disease with potential underlying uh, inflammatory bowel disease. We also can see it in a whole host of other conditions, including rheumatoid arthritis, individuals with underlying lymphoma or leukemia, chronic active hepatitis, or uh, forms of vasculitis like granulomatosis with polyangitis. Uh, we know the clinical manifestations of pyoderma gangrenosum, where we see often an initial pustule that splays out, splays out centrifugally. It may be hemorrhagic, as we see here, and then ultimately breaks down to have that classical rolled, raised, uh, violaceous border. Here's an individual with sweet syndrome. We see these uh, mountain relief type plaques that are pink to a violaceous as well. They will sometimes present initially as pustules, much like in pyoderma gangrenosum. Again, erythematous plaques and nodule. They may undergo vesiculation or even pseudovesiculation, uh, such as we sometimes see in bulla sweets. And again, these individuals may have underlying inflammatory bowel disease. Of course, we have to be concerned about underlying uh, hematologic malignancies as well. Um, just to point out to you that there has been a, a number of case reports of generalized sleep syndrome um, from COVID-19 vaccine uh, has been uh, reported uh, quite recently. 
Um, this individual is presenting with widespread, intensely pyritic uh, pustules, uh, typically on the bony prominence. This is a patient with derma dermatitis or herpetiformis. I actually presented this yesterday in one of my cases. Uh, as you know, uh, biopsies of this condition present with a characteristic neutrophilic infiltrate. Uh, there's positive direct immunofluorescence uh, for Ig uh, deposition, uh, both at the uh, dermal epidermal junction and also there can be granular deposits in the dermal papillae, as you see here. And I just want to close with some common disorders which may be cutaneous manifestations of uh, a variety of diseases like seborrheic dermatitis may be a cutaneous first finding of Parkinson's disease or even HIV. Erythema nodosum may be a presenting manifestation of a variety of conditions including TB, TB sarcoidosis, um, as you all know, and also a variety of infections. Dr. Friedman will be talking to us a little bit later about uh, cutaneous uh, findings in sarcoidosis, so I won't spend a lot of time on that, except to suffice, suffice it to say that when you do see cutaneous manifestations uh, of sarcoidosis, you have to keep an index of suspicion that they may have systemic disease. About 10% of these individuals will have underlying hypercalcemia as well, and so they, they do need aggressive treatment and referral accordingly to uh, both our rheumatology and our pulmonary partners. And uh, these individuals may develop neurosarcoidosis. So with that, understanding and recognizing and positively identifying cutaneous manifestations uh, is really important uh, in that it, it really it not only dictates uh, therapeutic measures that we, inter, uh, with the, we utilize for our, our patients, um, but also we have to make the appropriate referral to the uh, specialist, whether it be uh, an oncologist, uh, a rheumatologist, and the like. And so I thank you so much.